Well, now that Matt's here, we can start the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Trini Bassard, our chair, may or may not be able to make the meeting tonight. She's certainly going to be late. In her absence, I'm going to chair the meeting. My name is Larry Satkowitz, for those of you who don't know me. Um, we're going to start out with a Board of Liquor Control meeting, and we'll call that meeting to order. Um, first item on our agenda is the public comment for Board of Liquor Controls, and this would be for anything which is not on the agenda. Usually not a lot of public comment at Board of Liquor Control meeting. Seeing none, we'll move to approval of the agenda. I'll move approval of the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. We'll move on to our new business. We're looking at some liquor license renewals, Kim. Uh, yeah, well, Trevor's, yeah. Trevor's on. Oh, Trevor's I'm here, of course. <laughs> Trevor, you're not in 3D. It's hard to remember you're here. That's right, yeah. I'm floating through the digital ether here. Um, you have a list of all of the applicants that we've had all along. The ones that are up for consideration tonight are in the packets. They're the ones highlighted in yellow for you. There's a, it looks like there's at least three of them, I think, um, as I go through them. And they're for a mix of, we got one outside consumption permit, one second class, and a second class with a tobacco substitute endorsement. So Log Cabin Kitchen, DG Retail, and Middle Branch Market in Delhi. What is Log Cabin Kitchen? Uh, do we have the applications in there? I'm not entirely sure where that is. Um, I don't know if they're in there. We just put the list in there. Just the list? I forget. Is that the new restaurant? No, it's uh, short notice. Unless they're a DBA, log cabin kitchen. Is it for outside consumption? It is. Mm -hmm. That might be them. Uh, that would be my guess, just based on other activity. I think they're the only establishment that's new that would look for the outside consumption mm -hmm. permit. Mm -hmm. It's just a master list of all of them. Just highlight yeah. the other one. So do we, do we have the, the applications? No, uh, I don't know. Are they they're not in the packet? No. No, I don't see them in the packet. I can run up and maybe print them. I can see. Yeah. We should be signing them tonight. Right. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have them in front of us before we yeah. go, go any further. Yeah, he didn't bring in a return. I didn't notice. I don't even remember seeing them. Just the list, not the actual permits. It's just the list of who's applying, not the permits. Right. He didn't bring those over. Right. And he's not up there. So, I'm not sure we can approve it. Approve without actually having the applications in front of us. Let's yeah. See. yeah. Is this something that we can get the applications and vote via email for? Um. Trevor, did you hear that question? Sorry, I was looking up. I can find Log Cabin Kitchen LLC, but the mailing address is <coughs> unlikely to be the location of the enterprise. Um, that it's a residence. But I'm sorry, what was the question? Could we put the packets in an email? Was that what it was? We don't have the applications in front of us and therefore um, cannot really act upon them. And, and Stephanie's question was whether we could get the applications and, and approve them um, in an email vote. And then ratify them later. I think as we get down to the police committee one, it sounds like we might be headed for a special anyway. And so what we could do is do that process and put that at the very beginning of that. I know if you're getting together next week anyway. Yeah, yeah, I would. I would suggest yeah. we go that yeah. route. Yeah. And it does look like that's where we're headed. I mean, we'll get to that when we get to it. But. Right. It's still not a sunscreen. Yeah. <laughs> um, Why is it dark? Okay. Well, without the applications in front of us, we're not going to be able to act. And so we will um, 
we, we will need to uh, adjourn this part of the meeting. Should and, I um, make a motion for to table? Would that be appropriate? Um, yeah, you could table and then essentially bring it back, or you could, there's no motion date, so you could move on to a motion to adjourn and just start fresh. Mm -hmm. Let's just go that route. Yeah. I moved that the Board uh, of Liquor Control adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Second um, meeting of the night. We have three meetings tonight. The Board of Liquor Control meeting we just adjourned. Our second meeting is a vicious dog hearing, and then we will proceed to our regular meeting. Um, the, uh, for the vicious dog hearing, the owner of the dog has requested that we postpone um, because the owner cannot attend. And so I'll be looking for a m motion that we recess this hearing until such time as the dog owner can attend. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And before you move on, one of the things that might be worth doing, just because this is open and active, the dog ordinance, section 7A, lets you essentially, you can pass you know, through a motion in order to confine the dog to the property. And then the caveat being that if that fails to be the case, you could we could impound the dog right away. And we provide notice of that while we reschedule. So it just provides some parameters for a dog that's alleged to have left the property to, to bite a bicyclist. Um, so hopefully we don't need to use that power, but it at least puts some action into motion should we need to, to break the glass and get that done. Right. Does, does the select board not have that authority in any event? Uh, uh, you, it's spelled out in the ordinance, so you surely do through that mechanism. Um. <clears throat> so, so if, so... So if we, so if we, without, without having to have a formal motion the select board if this dog is a problem between now and when we have the hearing we we could order order its impoundment we could the nice part about this is and it gets back to what we've talked about before is that state law considers dogs property and because their property due process takes on extra weight so if you do the motion you've taken formal action we'll provide him notice of that so then if we do have to impound the dog we've got the the action in the paper show that goes with it while we set up the hearing. So it's a little extra added layer of protection that doesn't only cost us the certified letter postage fee or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, so before we will we adjourn. It, it the, does appear the, there, are, unless I'm mistaken, it does appear there are two bite incidents. Are you aware of that? Yeah, uh, you've gotten, you've gotten a little a little bit of a track record in there so when you hold the, yeah so when you hold the hearing it'll be on the latest incident the one that was reported and for which the process started but when you think about potential remedies there's certainly a track record of mm -hmm. or an alleged track record i should say of, of similar behavior looks like someone has a question yeah you have a question yes my name is betsy race Yes, um, does your health officer have anything to do with your ordinance in Randolph? With the, with the dog ordinance? Yes. We have an animal patrol officer okay. who oversees the dog ordinance. Okay. The health officer also has the rights and responsibility to dog bites under their uh, legal the purview. purview with the state. So does, the dog, does the dog have a rabies vaccination? That's all in the materials. I think that was one of the questions was licensing and a current rabies certificate. Um, the health officer has been involved once the bite report came in and the health officer and animal control officer actually went out there together. So they're, they're working side by side through this as well. Thank you for that question. Awesome. Thank you. So just to clarify, we can, in the interim between now and when a hearing is held, we can order the dog confined to the property. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to that effect uh, then because um, as somebody who has previously worked in the animal welfare field uh, and who is aware of previous uh, allegations of, 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 of dog bites and dog violence um, here in the community, I just 
I, I believe we should err on the side of caution and um, keep this animal confined to the property until we can go through the proper <clears throat> uh, judicial proceedings. So I would make that motion that we um, notify uh, Mr. Skrill that he is to um, keep the animal confined to his property, which is, it appears he's attempted to do, but this dog seems to have a propensity for getting off mm -hmm. leash. The, so. And I think the pertinent part is the, the second piece, which is that if the dog does leave the property, that the dog will be yes. impounded. I would, I would add that to my motion as well, that we, that we um, uh, will impound the dog um, if, if it does um, escape the property. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 The motion passes. I motion to adjourn the vicious dog hearing. And I second. All in favor. Aye. 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 We'll move on to our regular meeting. This is the time now for public comment in the regular meeting. So this will be comment for items that are not on the agenda. Yes. Good evening, my name is Benjamin O'Brien. I'm a resident of Randolph, I live up on Stock Farm Road. I just wanted to address uh, some of the issues surrounding the rec camp enrollment and some of the issues with the, uh, the way camp has uh, been administered and uh, purveyed to people who have registered for the rec camp already. Um, registration for camp started in, I believe, the end of February, the beginning of March. Um, and on the day it opened, we, my family, enrolled our child for multiple weeks of camp. Um, it was on, I believe it was April 21st, I received a phone call from the rec director looking for our opinion on whether we were on board with our child be going to the school for part of the camp day. Um, and as I understand, this was part of a grant that was applied for. Um, this was not purveyed to anybody that I'm aware of. I've talked to multiple other parents. Um, and we're somewhat disappointed that this wasn't, we weren't aware of this prior to camp registration. Um, I, it is our opinion, I'm sorry, let me back up. So I received a call from the uh, rec director on the 21st. I ended up touching base on the 22nd of April. Our conversation was probably for a half hour, 45 minutes. I expressed my uh, displeasure during that phone call only to find out that this was already set in stone. So she was calling for, to see what our opinion was on it. At the end of the conversation, I found out this is already set in stone that our children would be going to school for part of the camp day. Um, and I think if, there were, if this was relayed to us ahead of time, we may have made different decisions. Um, so the, and I also asked at the end of that conversation that uh, I received an email laying out what part of that day look like. I believe it's going to be for three or four weeks of that camp. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the exact number uh, with me today. Um, the most recent communication uh, from camp came out with the schedule on the 19th of May. There was still nothing alluding to what that schedule looks like with the children going to school the elementary school for part of the day um, and I just we're, we're very kind of frustrated with the process this year and how it went down uh, I've spoken to members of the recreation committee who told me that they had during uh, one of their meetings that they had conversations with the rec director saying that they should not go forward with this plan of sending children to the school um, this year they were told that it, the grant had already been accepted and this was going forward. So I am here just to express my displeasure with the way this process happened. I, I, I really wish I wasn't here, um, but this is a disappointment to a lot of other families that I have talked to. I wish there was more here tonight, and I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the May meeting. But, uh, you know, this. Camp, 
during the summer is supposed to be for fun for the children. I understand some people use it for daycare. That is not the case with most of the families that I talk to. It's for our children to get out, socialize, have fun, be outside, use the facilities that the town has to offer. They don't need to be in school. I understand that there are some caveats to that with other families, but that was never relayed to the masses. So I'm here tonight just to express my displeasure with that. And hopefully moving forward, that if this is going to be the case again, um, that this is relayed prior to any registration, that there's plenty of notice pr prior to any registration, that everybody will be aware of what they are paying for, what they're getting into ahead of time, and what their children are going to be doing throughout the summer. I'm all, it also uh, came out that with this grant, there was going to be some refund of camp fees. Uh, we haven't heard anything about that to this point. I haven't seen any refunds to this point. And um, I guess I will just I will tie it off with that. But thank you for your time and listening. And I hopefully moving forward that we don't end up in this situation again. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that comment. So I don't know if you want to. We don't normally. There are some timeline things that we can add to this well, if folks want or we can hold it for later i'm not looking for an argument ben i'm just trying to you know i, I, I just you you spurred my memory on just one thing so with the last communication on the 19th there was deadlines to uh, uh pull out of certain camp weeks with um, administrative fees assessed uh one of those was starting april 29th that email came out on May 19th. I'm not saying that we're looking to pull out of anything or looking for refunds, but I think that communication came out way too late for people who may have wanted to pull out and are now gonna be assessing an uh, admin fee as well. And they were staffed admin fees for weeks at a time, so thank you. Um, I know public comment, there's no discussion to be had, but I am the recreation coordinator and I work with Paige. Mm -hmm. And um, that partnership is not set in stone. It's something we have been exploring, um, but it, it has been seen to not necessarily be a great fit. And I'm happy to talk to you about this <coughs> afterwards great morning. and help that. clarify some of this. Um, but yes, I have joined the page to explore more capacity within ourselves as a rec department and then as a community. And um, I'd be happy to help you understand what we've decided to do. But what you've explained is not set in stone. Okay, because yeah. the way it was my yeah, I just last don't, yeah. I, okay. I, not like to have a discussion. Sorry, we'll have a discussion, but I just want to make sure that there is clarity for you so you're leaving this meeting with understanding of the full scope of Fair what enough. is not going to proceed with what you might have been impressed with. Thank you. But, and just maybe a couple things. This was not our grant. We were approached by the school, which got the grant. This happened after the initial enrollment. It was seen as a way to provide food to campers that might not otherwise have access, busing to campers that might not otherwise ha have access to expand the capability for enrollment so more kids could go to camp. And, um, and so that's why it was explored, because those are also common areas of feedback in prior years that we were looking to maybe have a chance to remedy along with somehow sharing resources when nobody has enough camp counselors anywhere period so i want everyone to know the intent was always good and it was about how do we get more kids to camp more kids fed more kids to have the best summer possible so but what you signed up for is what camp will be this year just for your you can sleep well tonight thank you <laughs> but I will say I, I'm not the only one that has this, that understanding who has had conversations with Paige. Sounds like so, we'll put out a statement so there's some I good think, clear. I think communication is the bigger that sounds overall great. message here. Great feedback. Thank you. Other public comment? Yes. Um, so I have an issue we're not going to go over tonight and I have open a uh, you know, I'm sending you a message, Larry. I guess you haven't got to it yet. Can you but, state your name? Uh, Toby Long. Uh, so I, I have not found a way to file a grievance with the town. Um, it's not on the website. There's no forms. Um, and I don't know how to go about filing a formal grievance with the government. Hmm. 
we don't have a form you could send an email with the concern to me i think that would be that's how most people start their grievance processes okay. we i reached out to trini this morning about the, the situation and i believe she said she would reach out to you um yep. so I'm, I'm fairly well you're 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 aware of that so we were not aware if there was a formal grievance procedure a paper trail or how we were supposed to pursue that so um if that is the case then i guess we can wait to hear back from you sir yeah we'll hear back from you we'll have a meeting like i said we're not going to go over it tonight a select board meeting but we good? Yep. Thank you for your time. Um, also, just another comment. Could you have instructions on the website on how to file a grievance then? <laughs> uh, because, you know, someone like me didn't know. It's just a simple email. I think that would be useful information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Other public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. <coughs> move, uh, we approve the agenda for the regular meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Consent calendar is next. So just to, sorry, I was making notes about the grievance thing. You approve the agenda. We'll handle the fireworks then under the 4th of July permit application. That that was the potential addition. Would you prefer that we do something different I, I, cover? I was thinking of as a standalone, but at this point, I think we could just because the applicants are slightly different. Um, that's why it might make some sense just to split them out. So add the fireworks. I'll, I'll um, yeah, like five point eight and a half. Basically, put it right after the permit applications, and we'll we can deal with that. I right love the e and a half. That's great. <laughs> um, I, I move that we amend the agenda to uh, add consideration of the Fourth of July fireworks. Um, uh, under under five uh, A um, assembly permit applications. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion, Aye. Pa motion passes. Okay. So now we'll move on to the consent calendar. So yeah, it's just the minutes from prior meetings and ratification of any warrants that you've approved otherwise in the in between. Okay. I move approval of the um, consent, consent calendar as, um, as stated. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And I can move on to our, our new business. And this is where we uh, will talk about the 4th of July parade assembly permit application. Yep, I think by and large, it's as we understood it, we had a planning meeting with the Chamber of Commerce folks Friday, I believe it was, um, of last week to try to talk through some of the logistical issues, some of the things that are different this year. I mean, some of the things that aren't different are the parade route that's proposed is the same, the after party in, at the rec field, you know, hours of operation right down to, I think even some of the dance and other performers are the same as prior years. I know Morgan's always excited about the, the line dancers that, that are there every year, um, but, uh, so there's not a lot of change. That what is different, though, is is again is our capacity, particularly when it comes to the law enforcement that we've been able to pull in years past. Because there's a lot of control points with that parade route, especially with that Maple Street Highland kind of uh, zigzag that's in there. So we wanted to make sure that we spoke of, about that, that we were pretty clear in terms of what we could reasonably expect as a high end for law enforcement resources. Um, there are certain intersections areas where it makes sense to have a cop. And then there are there other areas where we could put maybe volunteers or barricades that we understood the number of barricades who was responsible where do they go so we sat and started all of that we've got some things still to work out from a detailed perspective but i think we're headed in the right direction with that and we will keep talking so that we avoid any of the issues we've had in past years where the parade's about to start and there's some element missing um, but by and large the event itself doesn't seem to have changed a heck of a lot, um, but our capacity to to respond is is certainly less, and we try to we're trying to talk about it now so that we can be thoughtful and approach so that we can make sure that we hit our marks. Yes, comment, question. Yes, I just wanted to add that it's Andrea Easton. Um, I just came from a chamber meeting for the fourth, and we are going to. And I ran into Scott upstairs 
We are going to um, get in touch with ADT traffic to fill in the blanks in the security piece. And Scott, I thought that was a good idea. Um, Linda's going to make that phone call. Great. And everything else is falling into place. And the line dancers, if they do perform, they are being asked to do a um, incorporate the crowd in a dance to teach people and assumably start with the young crowd and just do it about half an hour at the end of the music venue. So, uh, wow. interactive dance. Great. Is what we would Excellent. Interactive line dance. <laughs> So uh, before we further, I, I sit on the board for the chamber, but I'm not involved in the 4th of July planning. So I don't know if there's a conflict of interest there, which then throws everything into a little conflict bit. Conflict of, of interest in Vermont is pretty narrow. Okay. Um, unless there's something that we're considering that affects you in a specific, typically financial way, and doesn't affect other people in the same kind of a way. Um, it's usually not considered a conflict, so I think we're safe here. Okay, yeah, I just want so. to mention it publicly. Yeah. No, okay. it's, it's great to mention anything that which yeah. might be perceived as such. Yeah, yeah. for I mean, sure. Similarly, I'm on the RACDC board, and we have okay. issues involving yeah. RACDC. But yeah, as long as there's no material or con compensatory gain, that's that's specific yeah. to you know you. Okay. And this uh, issue wouldn't so. that would be different than yeah. you know what it would be for other people. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. That's great. So um, uh, I'll, I'll move that we uh, grant the uh, assembly permit for the White River Valley Chamber of Commerce 4th of July parade, um, subject to the ongoing discussions that um, the municipal manager um, referenced. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. And um, since we're on the topic of 4th of July, why don't we talk about the fireworks? Yeah, we, we were informed earlier today that it um, sounds like the Lamps and Howell folks who had kicked in last year to sort of rescue the display along with business owners who contributed are willing and able to, to provide the full funding amount. Um, it's uh, going to be another combination Forest Hill Ellis lot sort of venue if it goes off as planned. Um, North Star Fireworks would be the vendor. I think they're looking at July 3rd has been what I've heard. Um, they were still trying to sort out the rain date. July 5th looked like an, a likely option, but um, when I talked to Paul Ray, they were trying to pin down exactly what, when that would be. So it sounds like we can have fireworks. The wrinkle with the Ellis lot this year that isn't, hasn't been present in past years, we've started our North Wells and Reservoir project right about where you'd light fireworks off historically. There's enough room for the two to coexist with some careful planning. Kingsbury's been very good if we communicate at it near the contractor. So I think we could figure out how to make it all work. Um, July 3rd would be a project work day until about 5 p.m., but obviously July 4th, um, the, the site's shut down for the day for the holiday. Um, so those are some of the details as I have them. What we're being asked is to approve the display as we have in prior years. We've already got a certificate of insurance in hand from the organizers providing the town with the, the appropriate coverage for the event. As I understand it, the fireworks are mostly, it's they're ignited up on our piece of the Ellis Lot Forest Hill property. People can view from the flatter area down below or from other spots around town. We certainly wouldn't have anybody viewing up or around where they're touched off and or our active construction site. So we just try to make sure that those safety and other accommodations are pretty well spelled out. So Tr Trevor, what, what specifically is the select board's role in approving this fireworks display? Uh, I think it's uh, traditional. It ties into some old, slightly archaic sections of statute. There are some displays that fire departments can approve, and they may even still have a role in this one. Um, I can check really quickly if you want to stick a pin in it and do a little historical research, but um, I think it's to provide that kind of final say over use of town property. And it's always nice with something like this to to broaden the circle of who's involved. Um, so so we would just be giving a, a general approval to launch fireworks on town property. It, yep, and then to sort of authorize me to work out the details with the organizers and we'll make sure it comes off safely. 
Yep. That sounds good to me. Do we have to motion anything? It sounds like we need a motion. Uh, I'll, to I'll move that the assembly permit, uh, and I'm assuming it is an assembly. I, is it an it assembly it? permit or is it um, a special yeah. event <coughs> permit? Yeah, let's do a, a, a supervised public fireworks display. <laughs> I, I move that we um, authorize a supervised public fireworks display for this year's 4th of July celebration. On July 3rd? Or On July 3rd. Or July 4th. Or July 4th. Or July 4th. <laughs> and then anything that needs to formally be signed in looking real quick, I think I see Scott in the corner. The local police chief and or fire chief can also sign off on, on the, the final version if we need. If Scott really wants the experience, I would be more than happy to. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. <laughs> Other duties as assigned, Chief. Right. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And we'll move on to the Slab City Mountain Bike Event Assembly Permit. Yeah, Morgan's there. She's going to know all the details. There's a good chance other people might ride if it comes off on the weekend as planned. So, so. Uh, Trevor, <laughs> you know Larry has ridden in it in the past. So last year was the first inaugural uh, Slab City Trail Challenge. It is a ride that highlights all of the single or most of the single track um, trails in the Randolph area. It was a smashing success last year. We had our um, kind of goal of 100 riders to understand what that sort of event looked like. We held it on a Sunday last year. Now that we know the scope of the event and what it takes to pull off, we've decided to put it on for a Saturday. Um, so we're excited for that with so many businesses open for folks to frequent when they're either here hanging out waiting for someone to finish, or after they finish, go get some food before they come back for the after event ceremonies. Um, it was a great fundraiser for the youth uh, mountain bike programming and general youth community bike programming that we do. So we're looking forward to a really fun event. Um, last year we did put in a permit and asked to serve alcohol on the property with permission from the property owner. Um, but the permit didn't get to the liquor control department, so it ended up that we didn't serve. So we switched it to a BYOB event, which actually ended up being a lot less of a, something to monitor for us. It was very nice um, to do it that way. The landowner was um, allowed that in the backyard there, so um, that was all good. And yeah, so um, any questions or uh, clarifications. <coughs> it was a great event last year, Dad, that it's continuing. Um, we do have checked off that we need law enforcement, though. Yeah, yeah so Scott worked with us last year. Um, I've talked to him about it already. Uh, he was the one officer on duty that day, just kind of patrolling generally. Helped us get the event started. It went up Pleasant Street, um, down Maple, over to the uh, Murray Castle trail access. So that was kind of the most major point that we needed him available was to kind of lead off the event. And we had a person outside of the vehicle doing traffic control, and then he was there with his vehicle for the mass crossing. Um, and then after that, he just kind of patrolled around the area just if there was any needs for help. But we had a very specific <coughs> traffic control folks that kind of moved through the event as it was in different zones to make sure that those major intersections were safe for bicyclists and uh, vehicle traffic. And he had a really great time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do helmets at that event? Give away helmets at that? Was that No, 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 we didn't do helmets at that event, but Scott has provided many helmet opportunities and great fun kind of partnerships with the um, police, with the youth bike and pedestrian stuff that you'll hear more about later. Um, and then just for emergency purposes, we did have Dave Aldrighetti and about five of his friends on e-bikes doing sweep. So if you don't know what sweep is, it's the end of the ride. There's people that are very consciously aware of folks' safety, mechanical issues, whatever it may be, that kind of just make sure everyone gets through 
the course. Um, and Dave is a part of the White River Valley Ambulance and Rescue Squad, so that's kind of our like emergency services on site and throughout the event day. So. Cool. Any questions or comments from the board? I uh, no. Okay. I motion that we approve the Let's assembly see. permit application for Slab City. And I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. If it passed unanimously, uh, we told Trevor we would waive his registration fee. <laughs> <laughs> Does it count if it's just three of us? No, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry, Trevor. Thanks for supporting the youth, Trevor, when you register. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to. I'll just say I'm going to have a very happy next door neighbor in that I imagine Sam Mason is one of the main riders in this event. He's so. one of our youth organizers as well. And yeah, coach, yeah. So and what a great kid. I'll yeah, just say that publicly. Time. Lots of fun. Yeah. All right. Moving along in our agenda, we, will, um, we have a, uh, an agenda item to consider appointments to the 2023 Police Committee. Um, there's um, there's some uh, concern uh, in the board right now that with two missing members for this important committee that um, we're going to postpone making those appointments until all five of us can um, weigh in together to do so. Yeah. I, I would just like to say that I, I would, would hope that we can schedule that special meeting as, as soon as possible yeah. because I, I've expressed not concern but just um, a, a desire to see the process given how little time we really have between now and November when we go into the budgeting cycle. Um, this is a, a serious issue that the whole community needs to be engaged in. We have some really, um, I think, qualified people that have stepped up and expressed an interest in serving, and i just like to, it, it's regrettable that, you know, people had um, other conflicts this evening, and it's totally understandable, but let's try and have that special meeting as soon as we can. Yeah, I, I think we all pretty much feel that. That's, yeah. I feel similar. Yeah, so if, if folks can send me some dates for next week, anywhere in the Wednesday, Thursday time frame. Yep. I don't know if that works, but that, if you get that, that I'm pretty quickly. That works for me. Uh, I've got soccer Thursday. Actually, no, I don't have soccer Thursday. You don't? No. Nope. Season's Thursday's, ending this week. <laughs> next Thursday is fine for me, too. I don't know where Trini and Erica are at, but um, Wednesdays are always tough for me, I can tell you. Cool. All right, so yeah, we'll, we'll verify it with everybody, but we'll aim for next Thursday at 5.30, and we'll add those liquor licenses just onto the front. Does that give us enough time to warn the meeting? For seven yeah. days? Assuming it's okay. Well, yeah. Well, we need 48 we'll, hours, we'll just, right? Yeah, to warn. We'll, we'll have to. We'll have to just. We'll. We'll. Can, we'll. We'll be able to schedule it via email. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, next up on our agenda is the uh, ARPA committee uh, presentation for how we're how they propose that we spend um, the ARPA money. Um, yeah, Matt, you're, that's you, right? <laughs> that's me, yeah. Uh, so I'm Matt Morosky. Um, another committee member uh, here is Maria Puglisi. I think that's the only members that are here. Um, and I, just, I wanted to give a, a, a summary of what we've done, um, talk about the evaluation criteria looked at when we looked at projects, give you a quick overview of, of the ranking of projects um, uh, that we reviewed, and then give some initial recommendations. I don't expect that... Um, uh, the select board to make decisions tonight and essentially bringing you up to speed on, on where we are. Um, and so to start with a, with a quick summary of the work, and I should back up, and before the committee even formed, just for benefit of people who are in the um, room here, the town of Randolph received one point, just about $1.4 million of federal money to be used, essentially as the select board wants to use it. Some communities around the state decided to do things like just replace some culverts, do some paving, and be done. The town of Randolph Select Board, you all or your predecessors, decided that they'd like to solicit input from the public on how that money ought to be used. Um, uh, 
um, formed a committee, um, and the committee went to work at soliciting and reviewing proposals. So um, the committee uh, came up with some evaluation criteria. Um, we developed an online application for people to submit proposed projects. Uh, did some advertising and received 35 proposals. We reviewed and scored and ranked them, and that brings us up to today. Um, and so I'll give sort of a 10,000 foot overview of what we've done here, and then use the select board can ask some ask questions. And, um, the evaluation, I want to talk about the evaluation criteria that we came up with, and it's included, I think, in your packets. Kim, you can correct me if I'm. No, they just have it. They just have it. So it's yeah. the second page here with some green and red on there. And we essentially broke the evaluation criteria into four different categories. One is connection to the original intent of the funding, which had to do with things like resiliency. Um, and social connectedness. Uh, second category was community benefit. Uh, so we'd look at whether a project had very um, narrow geographic reach or what was much broader than that, or whether it was uh, um, sort of whether it had broad demographic reach, that sort of thing. So that was community benefit. The third area was project viability. Um, you know, are there resources available to actually make this project happen? Is it compatible with, with town um, priorities and that sort of thing? And then the fourth of the four evaluation categories of evaluation criteria were um, it was connection to economic growth. And then you'll see, we don't have to go through it right now, but you'll see under each of those four categories, there's a bunch of sub-criteria. And we, as uh, members of the committee, um, looked at each of the sub-criteria and, and, and then came up with a composite score for each of those four categories, each category worth five points. And so there's a whole total of 20 possible points. So um, th that's that's how we that's how we went about evaluating each of these these the projects we received. Um, the ranked proposals. The the last page of what you have has it's a, a table that lists all of the projects ranked in order of their scores, um, and it lists also the scores. So you have it for your information. The scores for each of those sub criteria as well, and then the total score, um, and. Uh, uh, we, we, of course, won't, don't have time to go through each of these um, applications, right, each of these projects right now, um, but just for uh, uh, the, the top project, top ranking project was the Orange County Parent Child Center. Um, uh, and I don't think it's worth going through each of these individually right now, but I can, I can tell you that in terms of the, there are some sort of some general categories of projects emerged. Um, that it's sort of, I think, useful to have in mind. There's, there's a lot of projects, some ranking high, some not ranking high, that had to do with um, beautification in town. Um, so that was w w whether a specific project ranked high or not, it was just the committee recognized that there was a lot of interest in things that had to do with improvements of, um, um, just some improvements uh, to the various um, facilities in Randolph. There were also a number of projects, some ranking high, some not ranking high. Um, that had to do with walkability and bikeability in town, sidewalks and that sort of thing. Um, and then there were a number of projects that, another category that sort of emerged was uh, uh, recreational facilities, recreational opportunities. Those, so those, those three sort of stood out as main categories, whether or not a specific project ranked high or not. Um, And so I wanted to give you, just, uh, this is the first you sort of heard, I came once before to a select board meeting to give you a quick overview of where we were, but this is the first time you've sort of seen anything um, firm. And I, and I wanted to, um, and what you do with this information is, again, you know, the select board, you have the um, say in how you, you have the, the final say um, in how you decide to spend the money. You don't have to take our recommendations. Um, uh, but I wanted to, the, the, this committee came up with, a, with several recommendations we wanted to present to you, just ways to sort of think about how you might use this information when you decide how that money is actually going to get spent. And um, uh, because you don't, of course, have to take our, you don't have to take the top rank project, the second rank project, or the third rank projects. You, you could decide to, to use it in other ways. We, 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 we as the committee thought it was important that if you're going to do that, um, that you at least consider those four evaluation criteria, those categories that we came up with and see how a project would rank because I think the committee represented a nice cross-section of Randolph and um, uh, if you're going to use the money in other ways, uh, it, it, I think it would be worthwhile to consider whether it would rank well under those um, criteria. 
Um, another thing we've thought about and we wanted to put forward to you is that these projects, um, it's hard to see how for many of them, how they're going to get done because they all need either, they may need some architectural work, some engineering work, they, need, they certainly need a project manager, somebody to sort of champion. Some of these, I think the applications come with, with a person that could, that could maybe run with it, but most don't. Most are sort of general, get a sidewalk built. Well, it, it does take sort of staff time or somebody's time to actually make that happen. And we would suggest that if you're going to make these happen, I don't, I don't believe anyone, I don't think any staff people of the town have the additional capacity to make these happen. And we would suggest setting aside some of that ARPA money, it would be appropriate to use some of that ARPA money in our mind um, uh, for maybe a project manager to oversee some of these ARPA projects and see that they actually get completed. I don't know how it would happen, you know, better than I, but I don't see how it could happen without doing something like that. And again, we think that's an appropriate use of the money. Um, in terms of specific projects, our third recommendation is to, to, to use, our, use the rankings that we came up with. And if you're going to focus on individual projects, look at those ones that ranked high um, rather than ones that ranked low. So we would say focus probably on those top 10 projects rather than the bottom 10. Um, and then another recommendation is, is to, in, in addition to, um, uh, or maybe instead of focusing on individual projects, consider those broad categories. Uh, there were, like I said, a lot of projects that, that had to do with beautification. And it may be worthwhile to say, you know, we're not going to go with any single one of these projects, but we're instead going to say, let's commit $200,000 to, to beautification projects in either Randolph Village or Randolph as a whole. I think that would be an appropriate use also. And you certainly have the discretion to not go after a specific, not to support a specific project, but instead to look at categories. And I think that would be um, worth considering. Um, uh, what's that? I didn't say anything. All right, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the fifth of these seven recommendations we have is to consider using these ARPA funds for match money. So let's say somebody has suggested doing a sidewalk and you think the sidewalk is a worthwhile project. Many of these projects, um, not all, but many uh, 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 can be funded largely by grant funds available. And uh, some of those grant funds um, uh, re require a local match, and ARPA would be perfect for that. Um, and so you can really leverage the, that $1.4 million and make it go a lot further. Um, for some, fifth re or sixth recommendation is that um, some of these, so let's say somebody has proposed a project, um, you think it's worthwhile, it's scored high, and you want to give the money to that project. But it's a little bit unclear at this early stage how those projects were, or were they, were they really going to get done? And we would, we would suggest if you do support individual projects that you put um, a time frame on the, on the expenditure of that money um, and be able to sort of essentially claw it back at some point, de-obligate it uh, in the future. I think that'd be a wise way to allocate the funds. Final thing here. Um, is that uh, uh, we on the committee, we're, we're, we're available to do more work if you, after you re you've reviewed all, it's a lot of information and it'll take some time, I think, to digest it. And if you want, if you have questions and you want the committee to do additional work, we're certainly um, happy to do that. The, those recommendations that you just had that you spoke verbally, do you have yeah. notes of those that you could? Yeah, uh, uh, Kim has them and can pass them on to you, right? Okay. They're at the bottom of this, maybe she already has, the bottom of oh, that it was all, first it was page. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Do we have access to the applications there? Yeah, so that's, um, it, you know, I don't know that you do. They're available as a PDF, a 70-page document, so that's not easy to print out and give out, but, it, but there's no reason that can't be made available, I think. I and you can read the details of all the applications. A, yeah. it, it will be helpful as we zero in on yeah. Yeah. the ones that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think this information might be worthwhile to put on the website sooner rather than later. One thing the committee has not done a particularly good job of, admittedly, is to communicate with the applicants to let them know where things stand and such. And, and this will probably be worthwhile to put out mm -hmm. um, publicly, in, in, I think. Yeah, question. I just, just want to say that there are. Um, some proposals that we eliminated off, right off the bat, but they, it wasn't because they weren't good ideas. Uh, they just didn't fit some of the criteria. And some of them were very much um, uh, things that other people were t taking care of or were involved with already. And there's some, there were some water issues. Reduce the prices of the water that we're getting. You know, get the water quality back up. You know, the, they had 
requests like that. And uh, we couldn't do anything about that. <laughs> there was, that was something that the town itself was going to have to work on. Mm -hmm. So I think reading through the proposals would be good for you to know where people's heads are. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know they were concerned about Dudley Street. They were, you know, there's, there's there's different things that they were concerned about and wanted something done about it. Yeah. But they weren't the proposals weren't clear of how to do that or anything. Like that. Or they didn't just they didn't meet the four criteria very well. Yeah, but they they're, didn't, you know, it was making worthwhile out projects. Out of our bounds, you know. Yeah. 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 So additional ideas for things which we can do, even if they're not appropriate for this particular pool of money. Correct. Yeah. That's it. For the Betsy race. Do the top ten use all of the 1.4 million? That, that's a great question, and I, and I don't know. Um, when we solicited the proposals, we asked for a, um, a, a approximate range of cost right. for the project, right. as opposed to, and in hindsight, we probably should have said, how much are you asking for? And so we don't really know, um, uh, and that may be if the select board chooses to pursue some of these projects, one thing that the, the committee might be asked to do is go find out what exactly do you need, well, how much money are you asking for, how much would be impactful. Um, some of these projects would take the, would break the bank. They'd, they'd take the entire $1.4 million. Yeah. So that's probably not doable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just wondered because if they didn't cover, if the top 10 didn't cover all of the 1.4, maybe number 11 could be included. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're number 11. So. <laughs> the East Valley community also. So yeah. I can just answer that question just a little bit. A lot of those top top numbers had asking for 300 plus, 300,000 plus. Okay. Yes. So it, it could very much be the rest of the, the, the grouping could not be included because of the, months, the amounts of monies that they requested. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, the, we did talk about, well, if somebody wants a little bit, shouldn't we just, even though they're not at the top, give, give them a little? And, and the, the, uh, the town itself may want some, some of that money for things that they haven't asked for to us. Yeah, I know. You know, there's talk of digitizing records, for instance, and I would ask that uh, the committee would suggest that you look at the criteria and say, does that, does that work? Does that meet the criteria? And I think it would. If, if I, I think it probably would, but that's, that's a good example of something where you might just kind of weigh to see whether it's a good use of the money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have a, a question or comment from John and from the Zoom Lab. Hi, thank you. Um, could we get a reading of the top 10 project recommendations? Sure. Be happy to. Um, Thank you. Let's build some suspense, and I'm going to start with number 10. <laughs> um, number 10 is Randolph Community Solar, which is, which is putting in community solar fields that have some benefits to um, uh, groups of individuals uh, in Randolph. Um, number 9 is a public electric vehicle charging station. Um, uh, number 8. And this, and this is a tie, the two next two are tied at number, well, they were actually tied at number seven, is a community park at Smokestack area. Uh, it's number, it's also tied for number seven, is, is a town-wide beautification suggestion with a number of different specific aspects of beautification. Uh, we have three tying for number four. One of them is a conceptual design of the pool house and pavilion in the rec area. Uh, it's also tied for number four is improvements to the Blue Star Garden at Gazebo Park. Also tied for number four is stroll to Randolph Senior Center on a sidewalk. That's a sidewalk on Weston Street from, that essentially brings from the Senior Center out to Main Street. Um, I, number in third place is, um, uh, it's called Explore Randolph Farms, and that's essentially a, um, um, a, a public awareness campaign to uh, make people aware of local locations to purchase and source their food. Um, in second place, uh, downtown pedestrian improvements. And I'm forgetting the specific requests on that one, uh, but that's one of those walkability projects. And drum roll number one, I think I already said it, is uh, the Orange County Parent Child Center. Um, up on Route 66. Other 
comments or questions from the board? Comments or questions from the public? I'd like to th thank the ARPA committee for this really thoughtful and thorough work I, and the, you know, the, um, the criteria are, are just seem really well worked out and extremely helpful. So I'm sure that we'll be taking these suggestions very seriously and, um, and this will really be super, super useful when we go to actually appropriate the money. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is the uh, Bike Pet Group is going to present, present their survey findings. I guess, I guess that's me primarily. Oh, <laughs> do you want me to do that from here, Larry? Or? Um, sh sure. Okay. Sure. I don't have a specific person attached to this in the agenda. <laughs> um, so good evening. Uh, my name is John Kaplan, and um, also have uh, a few other members of our group with me: uh, Marianne Zavez, Mike Collins, and Morgan's been involved as well. Um, and Kim, I'm assuming you're looking for the slides. So. I am. <laughs> and I have my um, slides though there. So. so the main reason we wanted to uh, meet with the select board, yeah, that's the survey. Keep going. Oh, okay. Um, um, is just to primarily let you know that this group exists, um, and to discuss a little bit of the work that we've been doing over the past, I don't know, year and a half or so, um, and and then to. Uh, talk a little bit or get some ideas or thoughts from the board um, or the town manager about how we could collaborate with the town because we don't have any, you know, um, it's, it's a group of citizens at this point. Um, uh, at one point um, early on, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name, Mark Rizalbo's predecessor. Oh, Josh. 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 Josh, Josh yeah. was, he did come to some early meetings. Mm -hmm. So um, so I thought um, we actually have a mission statement. Um, and there's we have a whole document that has a little bit of a work plan or the beginnings of that. Um, so I'll just read the mission statement, um, which is, and our group is called Walk Bike Randolph, by the way. Um, is to work towards a Randolph in which all members of our community have access to our public spaces and can walk and bike safely and comfortably. Um, and I wanted to clarify. John, um, where do you want me on this? I, I think that my slides, they're the, yeah, if you keep going down. Okay. Yeah. It's after all these blue ones. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know if you want to share them all. Um, and so I wanted to clarify kind of a distinction between what we're working on and what Ridgeline works on so you know they are there's definitely a little bit of overlap and um, but you know they are have a I would say primarily a recreation focus where I think our focus is broader walkability and bikeability in town you know so that someone could you know go out to the grocery store by bike or walk to the grocery store or you know um, get off Amtrak and be visiting town and safely and comfortably walk to different destinations in town, that kind of thing. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Kim, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to read it from there, but um, there we have about roughly 10, I would say, active members um, who've been meeting pretty regularly, I'd say every other month or so. Um, to keep discussing, you know, how to move things forward. Um, and uh, we do have the Gear House has been involved, um, as well as uh, Devin, who, uh, I don't know the title of her position at the library, but she does a lot of kind of community outreach. And, um, and then Morgan from Ridgeline. So uh, if you go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, and we did, I saw in your packet, you did get the um, survey summary slides. It's like 
I don't know, about 25 slides or so. Or so. Um, so we did, we worked with um, Local Motion, who is uh, the statewide bicycle and pedestrian advocacy organization. Um, they, for you know, no charge, they work with communities and groups like ours to help them kind of get going. Um, and one of their suggestions early on was to do a community survey, which we did in um, May and June of 2021. And uh, so just a few of the, the high points from that survey, and it was, we got a pretty good response. I think it was like 110 responses. Um, it wasn't limited to just Randolph. Um, like we did have uh, people from Braintree and, and Brookfield responded. Um, mm -hmm. And so just a few, I just pulled out a few of the bullet points from that survey. Um, this one I was kind of surprised by. 15% uh, of respondents mostly walk or use an assistive device for transportation. Um, that was a lot higher than I would have expected. And I know that that's higher than like the state average. 89% um, supported <coughs> building, improving, and maintaining sidewalks. 83% uh, supported widening shoulders for bicycling. 78% uh, supported installation of marked bike lanes. And 75% were interested in walking and biking more frequently for transportation. Um, and if you looked at this survey summary, you'll see there was questions about um, kind of uh, like if you don't walk now, what are, you know, kind of what are the barriers? And it was things that you would expect in terms of traffic safety, um, you know, intersections. Uh, I can't remember all the different reasons, but um, so there, there are reasons that people don't walk or bike, um, and but there's a lot of interest in walking and biking. So there's a little bit of a, you know, kind of a gap there. It shows that there's some things that could change possibly to make people feel more comfortable walking or biking. Um, so as far as uh, like ongoing initiatives or things that we've started working on, um, mostly in collaboration with Design, there has been an effort on the youth bicycling and the library is involved with that also. Um, and I'm just gonna go through this list kind of briefly and then I'll let Marianne talk about this year's Bike to School Day, um, which she was very involved with organizing. Um, so we did do a bike to school day in early May. Um, and uh, another thing that we've talked about and we started last year, we didn't complete it, but um, looking at like where are there bike rack locations around town? You know, if you wanted to bike somewhere, is there a place to park your bike um, and secure it if you wanted to lock it? Um, and we did put in an ARPA application. I think Morgan did that for us. Um, and if I remember right, Thanks that was. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was the one. That, that was for two? like bike racks and the tools. Bike racks, <coughs> <they're> finding, <coughs> find it. Oh, yeah, so finding, if someone right. was to get off the train, you know, they would understand where to go find the public park access or whatever it may be. So just wayfinding and yeah. Yeah. yeah, wayfinding, um, you know, downtown maps and also um, various signage that would uh, give better educational opportunities for pedestrians and uh, vehicle operators around how the two transportation options intermingle. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we've identified that education is a, is a high priority um, with drivers and pedestrians, um, whether they're biking or in their vehicle or walking, crossing. Um, so, Marianne, do you want to sure. talk about um, the bike this school day? Sure. And Mo Morgan was part of that, oh. and so was Mike. So, um, this was the first year that we did a bike to school day, and we actually made it a bike and walk to school day in case kids didn't have bikes. We wanted it to be like super inclusive. Um, so, bike to school day is always in May because that's National Bike Month. And, and there's a lot of communities in Vermont that do Bike to School Day. There's a lot of communities nationally that do Bike to School Day. So it's kind of a big thing. 
um, in a lot of communities, the schools take the lead, and the schools were super important, obviously, to making this a successful Bike to School Day. And Devin from the library, and uh, Morgan on any of this, correct me if I'm getting something wrong, but um, she was the main liaison with the schools, and the schools were very supportive. They did a lot of outreach through their newsletters and other ways that they communicate with families. And um, so, um, but, but it wasn't school-based this year. It could be, I think, in the future. So this year it was community-based, and it was basically Ridgeline, it was Walk Bike Vermont, it was the library. Gifford donated some helmets, so Gifford got on board. They were interested. And so um, what we decided was that we would have meetup spots around town, and so we had five meetup spots, and they were up on Hospital Hill, the gazebo, um, Randolph Circle, Fars Hill, and um, tennis courts. And um, we had no idea like how many kids would show up. We didn't know how many kids <laughs> would show up without a helmet. That's we awesome. asked all the kids to show up with a helmet. Um, we asked younger kids to show up with a parent or an adult who could ride with them, but it being the first time, we really didn't have any expectation. We really didn't know. And lo and behold, we got, um, I was at the gazebo, and we had about at least maybe 15 kids. Just at that location. Just we at that location. over 30 participate with the formal groups, um, and then there were probably close to 50 bikes outside of the school when we got there. Kim helped with my group as a walker. Mm -hmm. um, it was, she can Fun. say it was super, super cool. And then Scott was also on patrol around um, and then met us at the school um, and all the kids got a late arrival. Um, mm -hmm. It was great. So thank you, Scott, for being around. The kids were super excited to see you at school. <laughs> <laughs> the friendly police officer, so. Yeah. So, um, so, the, so we, we were thinking we would have elementary and high school age kids and we actually were focusing on fifth grade through 12th grade, but we ended up getting, I think, solely elementary school age kids. So that was something that we learned, and we ended up getting a lot of younger kids and newer riders. So the group that I led from the gazebo actually was like 15 kids who were younger or beginner riders. And so we were on the sidewalk. We had decided ahead of time that those riders would ride on the sidewalk. And we had like four or five kids who were older and comfortable riding in the road. So we had those two groups um, going at the same time. So it was a very long um, train on the sidewalk, which you know raises issues, safety issues for pedestrians. So that was you know something that uh, you know to think about, talk about for next year. But it also raises these general safety issues about you know can you safely bike in Randolph? Can you safely bike on the main street? Um, and if you can't, you know, and when I'm just in town, I see mostly kids on sidewalks. Kids of all ages are riding on the sidewalks, and then you have, uh, you know, potential issues with pedestrians. So I think, you know, our general mission of, of making biking and walking safer and more comfortable for everybody in Randolph, it's a broad mission, but I think it's, it's a good mission. So that's where, that's where we're headed with this. Um, so it was, it was successful. We want to do it again. We're hoping to get more yeah. people and make it more inclusive because it was really super fun. Yeah. I had so much fun that day. And really. Marianne was able to get us all uh, creamy coupons. So creamy we coupons. The kids were so excited about creamy coupons. <laughs> and I just, wanted to give, I just want to give a brief update, too, about the work that Devin and I have been doing with the After School yes. Bike Club. Yeah. Um, so we did an after school bike club it was about I think, four mondays uh leading up to this event and we did one following as well um so it was after school mondays we were at the library uh the focus of this group was safety and maintenance for kids bikes and it was really successful and well attended we had eight to ten kids the first two mondays and a good mix of homeschool kids um kids from who know where they were from, they were riding after school and joined our group. Uh, we focused on safety. We talked about how to ride on the sidewalk respectfully. Um, if you were to, you know, meet up with a pedestrian, get off your bike, how to cross your bike across the crosswalk. Um, and then getting some feedback from them about how they feel about biking in town. Um, and there's a lot of kids that have gained a lot of confidence in their riding ability. Mike has been there as a maintenance person. 
So there's been kids who he's been able to fix aspects of their bike that are uh, just general safety concerns. And through Ridgeline, we have a scholarship fund that is more word of mouth. So through these programs, we've identified kids that have either brakes that aren't working or repairs that need to be made for their safety. So we've been able to send them to the gear house and have those repairs covered. Um, and it's, it was a huge hit. So we ended up with 17 kids on the bike to school Monday for that after school, which was a huge group and it was super fun. Um, again, like probably a quarter of that group was homeschooled kids. So it was really fun to see the integration of the different kids. And we did our last one um, this Monday. Uh, just great fun. And um, although you all see me with my mountain bike trail hat on, I'm very passionate about making sure um, that these opportunities are accessible for a lot of kids. And the education aspect is a really big piece of it for the safety um, and, you know, the, the, the trust that the vehicular people that love to drive their cars have in the work that we're doing, knowing that we're educating folks to be thoughtful and um, not just ride their bike because they're small enough to cut through traffic um, type of stuff. Anyways. That's great. Um, just one, just a couple last things just to wrap up. Um, so one thing that we've thought about, and this is the main reason we're here, um, is, you know, is there some way to collaborate with the town? Um, and just some possible ideas are in sort of the capital planning process. Like, um, I know that there was some kind of a sidewalk inventory that Josh Jerome shared with us a while back that was completed, but um, I'm not really sure the current status of that or how that's getting rolled into possible like sidewalk work. So that's a possible, you know, we could possibly help with fleshing out that inventory. Um, you know, there's definitely a connection to economic development. You know, there's a big focus now on kind of walkable downtowns and um, also kind of the tie-in with the recreation trails. One of the things we've talked about is like making it possible to you know, get from the downtown to trails safely, um, and and vice versa. And knowing how to do that. That's <laughs> right. <a big> piece. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I know uh, Matt mentioned like grant grant writing or management. I think you know, sort. I mean, I oversaw two grant programs for VTrans for twenty years, so I have a lot of experience with that. And I think that's an area where maybe we could provide some service to the town, like if, with a sidewalk grant, for example, either writing the application or helping to manage a project. Um, I'm not sure the type of work that the Planning Commission is working on. That was just another possible idea. Um, and then, you know, like Morgan mentioned, uh, just kind of maybe assisting Scott with traffic safety issues, getting education out there in different ways. Um, and. So I guess the, that, that's sort of the, the ask at this point. We're not asking for anything in particular other than maybe is there uh, a point of contact within town government that we should work, you know, try to continue to communicate with or kind of where to go from here. But there's some good, you know, there's a lot of good energy, I feel like, and with the help that Local Motion gave us in early on to, you know, come up with a mission statement, start a work plan. We've got energy and people who are interested. And, and I think it's interesting that, you know, two of the top 10 ARPA projects were sidewalk projects. So I think that kind of reflects a broader community interest in, mm -hmm. in walking and having safe places to do that. Uh, no, I, just a comment. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that this presentation flowed right on the heels of the ARP presentation because it, it, it just gives us a lot to think about how we can synthesize some of the different threads here and uh, some of the different threads in your report and kind of weave them together. and through ARPA funding and grant, seeking grants and so on, really approach this in a really thoughtful and comprehensive way. So thank you. I think Trevor did that on purpose. Good, good <laughs> move, Trevor. <laughs> sure, yeah.
Yeah, that was great. Thank you for, for that presentation. I, I'm, even though I know a lot of the people on, on, in the group, I, I wasn't so, uh, was, um, so completely aware of all things that you've been up to, so this is super helpful. And uh, I certainly would, um, uh, would welcome collaboration with the, with the town now to work on some of these objectives. It sounds really wonderful. Great, thank you. Next up, where are we at? <coughs> Next on our agenda is um, is an item concerning keep, um, the town becoming a pastor entity for a wastewater um, grant to uh, New England Precision. Yeah, they're the uh, much like we've been talking about it. It's happy coincidence that all these things fit together in some way but the state has its own arpa money that it's looking to to deploy in useful ways um and so dec has a pool of money they'd like to give three hundred thousand dollars to new england precision as a grant for some for a pre-treatment system i don't remember i think it was a maybe about a year ago within the last year and a half for sure that chris was in and we were talking about some of the different discharge limits for new england precision related to the, the wastewater stream that they're producing, particularly when it comes to various heavy metals. Um, and uh, so one of the ways they can tackle that and meet some of those lower limits that are coming for them is through a pretreatment system that they can install right there at their facility. The grant would be used for that installation and construction of this. Um, the wrinkle is that the state oftentimes looks to, rather than grant money directly, and I don't, I've never fully understood what the prohibition is, if it's federal or creativity or, or, or what. Um, like to pass the money through us, uh, through a municipality and then on to a private business. So it puts us squarely in the middle. We'd be the ones with the grant agreement. We'd be the ones responsible for the grant agreement. We have no other role than taking the reimbursement request from NEP, pushing it through to the state. When it's reimbursed, pushing it back through from NEP. Um, we spent some time trying to figure out exactly what the town's level of risk is, what we were being asked to do, um, and uh, have gotten some of those details. One of the best ways we can protect ourselves is with an agreement. I provided that with you separately. That's the contract item that you have for executive session, just in case you want to make any changes. But what that really attempts to do in the form of an MOU is spell out who's responsible for what and what happens if everything goes sideways um, and tries to put it very clearly for everybody up and down the chain that we are truly here um, just to pass money to and through. Um, we will also be doing something with this one that we haven't been very good about doing for years and years and years, which is trying to recover our own costs for administering these grants. We do an awful lot of these pastor grants and we haven't historically going back years done a good job at tracking our costs and going to get them sought. We've always sort of considered them part of the public good. But with this one, we're a private entity um, benefits wherein we're being asked to do something, frankly, out of cycle and out of character. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to get ourselves paid for that so that the ratepayers are are protected and, and made whole. While we also help a local business, we also help the state get its ARPA funds out the door. So it seems like a way that everybody can get what they need. So what, is somebody in the sorry when i'm remote like this i could just hear the voices and i wasn't sure if they were in the hall or i was having a flashback of some kind <laughs> was there a question for me or no it was just upstairs. no it's just upstairs i closed the doors all right thanks um so, so what the state's really looking for from us at this point is whether or not we're interested in participating um they'd have a grant agreement to us, there's been a draft floating around. There were some things that NEP had to produce um, for some of the regulations. They've done that. We have them in hand, such as they create a purchasing policy. They had to um, do a risk assessment, do a few other things, and, and they've done that, and we have those. Um, so that's really what, what we're sort of considering is whether or not we want to serve as that pass-through. We think we can mit mitigate any of the town risks. We think that the first step in that process, though, is executing that agreement with NEP. And then we execute a grant agreement. So we may be back in July with a formal grant agreement or at some point thereafter, provided everybody signs up on the front end to the other piece um, so that we walk them out that way. But that's the way we've been able to figure out how to structure this to, to maybe get this done. Questions? 
questions or thoughts? Um, I guess I would just say that as, um, in my role as the chair of the Water and Wastewater Committee, um, we've worked quite a bit with New England Precision and, um, and they've been really good partners. Um, I mean, they're, they're customers of the, of the Water District of the, and the Wastewater District, but, um, but they are pretty, you know, they have a pretty substantial operation over there. They're employing a lot of people. They're doing, it seems like they're doing really good work and they've been um, really good about communicating with the, with the town in the, in the past about what they've been up to and what their plans are and what they'd like to see happen in the future. So it seems, seems like a worthwhile endeavor for us to help them out here. Yeah, it seems positive to me. I yeah. would agree, yeah. Mm -hmm. So do, do we need a, a motion here right now, Trevor? There is a recommended motion that um, says that we be willing to accept the grant to serve as a pastor entity contingent upon New England Precision executing an agreement with the town prior to any town agreement with the state of Vermont. So moved. Second. <laughs> you take the easy way out. I do. <laughs> Very good. That was well done. All in favor. Aye. 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 Um, uh, delinquent tax policy change um, discussion for allowing the, the use of a postmark um, instead of having the, the payments tucked to the end on, on a certain date. Yep, so I guess this came up at a board of abatement meeting. I had this conversation with Erica about adding this as a discussion item when we dug into it a little bit. Um, just knowing that it's not a statutory prohibition or, or any kind of consideration. It was a policy choice that voters made at town meeting i think in 2018 and we included that language in your packets along with the delinquent tax policy so if we want to change it that would be the avenue there's certainly plenty of time between now and march um, where we could consider that i um you know in my role i i'm agnostic i've used the postmark in other places and it's just about being really clear that it's a you know united states postal service postmark which is different from what you get off your postage meter um, and so the board of abatement still might find itself in that dispute even if it makes the change just based on that's what i've seen happen other places um so there isn't too too much to do tonight necessarily unless you want to set us on a course to explore change next march but um that's where that language came from and it was in the same motion as you saw where we set due dates and some of the other things related to how we collect taxes so this isn't an item that we're going to be acting on this is really just a heads up for future possible action yeah we put it on so we could have a conversation we looked into it i think the fact that the voters did it from the floor turned it into a different animal if it was just a policy change then that's something that obviously would be within the board's ability to to have an impact on sooner than later but we don't have any avenue to get the voters again until until next march so yeah yeah it seems to make sense. Uh, it's and consistent with what the IRS does with yeah. tax returns, right? So. And with how the, I mean, one of the abatement meeting situations was two checks were mailed, same day, same address. One made it, one didn't, mm -hmm. on time. And so, with the way the postal system is right now, just delays and things getting yeah. lost and does, stuff. Does seem reasonable to give the taxpayers benefit of the doubt in that yeah. way. Yep. Yeah. All right, further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move on. And talk about the uh, fiscal 24 paving RFP. Yep, yeah, it's a mm -hmm. wonderful time of the year again. It feels like we just did this maybe because we had to go back and, and fight for some repair work with the last years or the current years, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so this is just to authorize us to put the RFP out. Uh, it's a similar timeline as the last couple of years. Um, this would be, we're looking for a total program of about $530,000, but we're expecting or hoping 200,000 of that to be paid through a, what they call a class two grant, paving grants that we get from the state. We'd be due for one based on the regular cycle, so we're hopeful. Um, that would be used for East Bethel Road. That was a project that was on last year's list that we moved some stuff around to get Main Street and a few other places on. And because of the length of it, we moved it into this year. So that's sort of the uh, the bell of the ball here, at least with these projects. 
Some of the other ones are smaller ones that are in there, really would complete an entire section of town or thereabouts um, and address some areas. And then we've added Hargrace in just because of the sort of severe deterioration of that shorter stretch of road. Um, it's in truly interesting shape. Um, <laughs> if you're into overlanding, I think you like it, but if you drive a standard automobile, you're probably less enthusiastic uh, about a couple of the areas there. Um, so co-locates all of that. It's about 3.8 miles total. It means that within the last three summers from August 21 through summer of 24, we'll have paved 7.2 miles and spent $1.2 million after not spending a lot on paving in the preceding years at all. These are all similar projects. We're looking for a shim and overlay. That's where we sort of try to level everything out and put an inch and a half down. We have been going with that approach pretty broadly to try to bring the baseline up. And then as we build out future years of a paving plan, we'll get into distinguishing by different categories. You might see some more mill and overlay and full on reclamations where we do sub base and all of that. Uh, so this is for that RFP. All estimates are based on asphalt prices as we understand them at the moment. It's about $97 per ton. These are all funded through the town's capital paving reserve, which has more than enough to do this work. We're working to model the five-year plan out. It looks a little gnarly when you get out to 27, when you keep all the projects in there, just based on projected transfer levels from the general fund. We've gotten infusions of funds into the paving reserve in the past couple of fiscal years because we've finished um, essentially with surpluses and voters have determined that a certain percentage of any money in excess of our emergency funding and some other needs goes into the paving reserve first and into our gravel road reserve second. We may be able to be in that spot. We got our draft agenda back from last year. I don't want to put that out there as a certainty, but it's possible um, that that could be the case again um, sooner than later. But for now, what we're using is the money that we know or can reasonably expect. So we're good for the next couple of fiscal years, especially with the grant. And then every year we look at these, we look at condition, how's condition changed, how have asphalt prices moved or have they moved? Um, are there things that are co-located? Are there other projects that make sense to, to have the paving done sooner than later um, and try to do that? And so John and I, we take a tour, we go out, we, we drive them all, we get out, we walk them where we need to, we look at all of them. And, um, so this is the list we've come up with, and we've got a working list that goes from last year on through fiscal 27, I think it is. It's about a five-year window, and that gets very nearly all of the town's 24-ish, 25-ish miles of paved roads within that time frame are pretty close. Um, so some of the trick is we've got a few longer, bigger ones. So Beanville Road's sort of the next big one kind of in the hopper, but given the length how we're putting money aside. It's just trying to figure out what's the right year to be able to do that. And obviously if we don't get the class two grant, we've got to split East Bethel Road up into to sections and reconfigure those outer years. Trevor, in, in addition to the East Bethel Road and, and Hard Race, what were some of the other roads that are planned? Yeah, yeah we're gonna make we're gonna make Tom's drives real nice. We're gonna get up into the neighborhood around Lincoln and all the little streets there, the short section of fails. We've been picking away at the Airbrook Road, and there's a small section left of that that makes sense to finish out while we're just right there. Um, and so it's East Bethel Road is from VTC all the way to the intersection with Crocker. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned fails, the short segment of that. That's the one in between some other work we did somewhat recently, I think within the last 10 years or so on um, summer and on, on the other side over by the funeral home. So that'll finish off that linkage. So there's in total, there's three, six, nine different roads, but some of them are very short, you know, Brook Street at less than two tenths a mile, Arlington Drive at three one hundredths, you know, little spurs um, that are in there as well. But East Bethel Road at about 2.4 miles is the big one. Mm -hmm. In that and we we're trying to each year when we do these projects also try to mix them up geographically so that everybody sees some work because we are sensitive to that um uh, feedback that we've received that you know you're too village centric you're too rural centric and so we're trying to say all right let's look at condition and need and then also try to think about geographic balance so we've done you know we'll do east bethel we've done fish hill it seems that the village roads are a little farther behind so there's been a little more of that for sure there's also more of them <clears throat> So that's why last year we focused a little bit because some of those sections were 
creating real maintenance issues um, with the rutting and and other conditions. It's been much yeah. easier to sweep to plow <laughs> everything this last winter and into the spring. It's been much easier as a result. Yeah. So the overall cost also includes. I think we mentioned it in the in the report, but this has in there um, where paving tables built. If there are any milling costs. Um, these really shouldn't have any separate, but painting, there's a contingency that's added onto these. So hopefully we have a little wiggle room should the asphalt prices change and or something unexpected occur. So what we'd be looking for from you folks would be the authorization to publish and or otherwise distribute the paving RP as soon as we can get the ink to dry. So moved. Oh, I was gonna do that a second. <laughs> Feature to it. All there. Uh, hi. Hi. Motion passes. I think people are just gonna be really excited for traffic control again. I, I, I will be happy it. to <laughs> not lose my car. That's or, true. Or, it's or true. Animals or people in the potholes along Brook Street. Okay. <laughs> Next we'll consider awarding the uh, interim financing bid for the North Wells and Reservoir Project. You have to rise the RFP for this at your prior meeting in May. And so what we're looking to do is borrow a million and a half. That's roughly the amount that voters approved as debt service that we've got through the Drinking Water Revolving Fund. Um, we received two responses back, one from Community National Bank, one from Union Bank. They provided us each with the same kind of two options. There's a line of credit that we could draw on as we need, or there are a line of credits that we can take the uh, full amount in a single disbursement. And based on the way we've decided to fund this project, where we've got a drinking water loan that's reimbursement based from the state, a CVBG grant from the state that's reimbursement grace based, um, the Northern Borders Regional Commission grant that's reimbursement based, and a congressional earmark for 775 that is wait for it unless you know where I'm going reimbursement based um, we're going to need that money ahead of time so that we can keep the cash flow and protect um, some of our capital reserves we've already had to pay at least one bill from the water reserve with the idea of being that we pay it back so this lets us do that to have about as much safety as we can have we've been warned that the reimbursement process might be slower than it has been in prior years just because of staffing issues at DEC um, and we totally get that we've certainly had our own so we're trying to plan ahead a little bit so the recommendation there's a lower interest rate with the union bank proposal it's not quite a percentage point but it's close to both one year um, in length we also with the union bank proposal they offered a deposit rate and if you go back a couple of years summer of 21 when we did a tax anticipation note we we're actually able to make a little interest income based on the way that all sugared off so we may be able to see that again nothing crazy, um, but maybe a little bit to offset some of the costs. Um, similar, you know, fee structures or lack thereof, um, availability of funds is the same. They're both non-revolving lines of credit, meaning that we, the term is the term. Um, and once we're done, we're done. Um, and so we're just seeking authorization to, to pursue the, uh, the union bank bid to award it to them to authorize me to sign whatever I can. There may be a resolution based on what they sent for feedback in terms of what they need that will need you folks to sign at some point, or at least a majority of you. So anybody who's nearby might be tapped to come in to get that done. And then some of the other stuff's easy to collect, annual report copies, audit copies, those types of things. Sounds good. So motion to approve. How's it worded? Do you have it? Unless you take this one, Tom. I'll second you. Okay. <laughs> um, a motion to uh, award the interim financing bid for North Wells and Reservoir Project um, to Union Bank. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, second. Uh, oh, sorry. Second. Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes, and um, we'll move on to the uh, replacement of fuel pumps and security camera upgrades. This was one for our purchasing policy. We probably should have come on the front end. We had some opportunities to take care of things because of emergent circumstances, 
and uh, had some slightly accelerated timing based on installation availability and equipment. So there are two two pieces. They replace uh, some town office building repairs in the capital improvement program. So they're both currently paid out of the capital reserve for facilities where there's sufficient funding for this. Um, when we had the unauthorized opening of hydrants back in, what was that, October, November, um, that nearly depleted our water supply. Um, one of the things we found was that our cameras were either not working, were not current, or not communicating with any endpoint at all. So what we did was go around, upgrade those, update those, reinstall, put new equipments in, everything ties in to the police department. So that Scott or Rose or JM or whoever's there um, has a real time look. I can check them on my phone as can Paige and John and others who have facilities in there. Um, so that was for a total cost of 28.5. We went with Round Hill. They've been our security provider. It keeps one integrated system um, for us at this moment. We're looking at additional upgrades as we move forward or updates, but um, that's where that project came from. And then the other one was the fuel pump replacement. I joked before that I think the pumps were actually older than gasoline powered automobiles. Uh -huh. they, they had the rotating numbers that went round and round and we were having issues with accuracy um, in terms of reporting fuel usage. It, it always seemed that fuel disappeared at a rate much faster than what the gauges would record. Um, and we wanted a system that better helped us control access to it so we could better track it so that we could better bill because we build a school, both the buses and the maintenance staff for the for the gas that they use. Um, so this allows multiple users to do that from any number of terminals. They're all Wi-Fi enabled. We've got key fobs that go with vehicles. We've got pin pads that go with vehicles and or drivers. And so we can track fuel usage by vehicle and by individual and by time of day and with a single printout provide the school with what had been handwritten sheets with numbers that came down to us that were then hand entered into a spreadsheet that was then hand entered into a bill. Um, and we're already seeing more accurate fuel usage. We've got a better sense of where it go, goes. John and I have a standing bet as to who's gonna get the most surprising news. Uh, <laughs> I don't wanna spoil what those are, but, but uh, we think some folks are gonna maybe be a little surprised by how much fuel they do use, but it helps us better track it. Um, that was a long overdue one. We had thought at one point it might be a good fit for ARPA funds, but we had a chance to do it sooner than later um, and decided to take that. We researched different solutions, zeroed on one that um, you know trucking and other enterprises have used just for the reliability, the scalability. So it, it should be pretty good and last us for a bit. Um, so those are those two. So we just were coming back to, we purchased them, you've approved the AP warrants for them, but we want to make sure we hit the formal step where we ratify these specific purchases. Sounds good. Whose turn is it? Um, it's mine. Hold on. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I motion to ratify the purchase purchases as described. I will second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Yeah. Motion passes. Thank you, Trevor. And then um, our our last. Uh, business item is to consider um, water wastewater allocations for the uh, new restaurant going in at 29 North Main Street. Uh, yep, this lets them go from, was it 14 to 27 seats? So they're gallons per day. I'm reading the information rate goes to 297 for wa uh, wastewater or water and uh, 264 for wastewater. Chris has done the math for us. We're looking at a $2,177.05 fee for those new allocations on top of the ones that were already purchased for the enterprise that was there. The Water Wastewater Committee has recommended this. I think we've discussed it before in passing in conversations leading up to this too. So this is the this is that one, if anybody's remembering back a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Larry or Trevor, can you explain exactly what this means for you know a lay audience in terms of sure. is, is there a cap on the allocation they get each month or what what it, what does it mean to increase yeah. the allocation? Yeah, so it's your allocation is essentially the amount of and we base it on a gallons per day basis because that's sort of how the systems process and or fill themselves and or you know water comes in and wastewater goes out. Um, but that's your sort of daily average that you get for the life of your allocation. Um, 
And so you need a certain number of gallons per day of each in a restaurant scenario to have X number of seats. And so every time you add seats beyond what you're already approved to, you need to inch both of those up. And I think the state generally sets in this case what those gallons per day can be. And we'll see it with single family houses too. And I've seen those numbers vary from 210 at the local level in Essex to, I think the state at one point liked us to allocate 320 gallons per day. Um, so it's really to, to, to presume that based on whatever the structure is, whatever the use is, that there's enough water and wastewater capacity on a daily basis. Daily basis. Mm -hmm. I see. And, and our system has plenty of capacity for this sort of usage. Mm -hmm. So of proving it is, yeah. is really a no brainer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to get a little bit of clarity yeah. on yeah, the no, terminology. It's a, it's a fair question. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We're um, very fortunate with our with our capacity on both ends. Like we, we shouldn't have an issue with either for very long. Now that I've said that maybe there'll be a some kind of growth boom then suddenly they're under pressure, but somebody uh, opens a micro or yeah, my well, Yeah, we we need about a half dozen of them or something, I think. It, it's actually really nice for the ratepayers of the water wastewater district to have additional capacity being used because that helps spread the cost. Spreads the cost. Because most of the cost of the system is pretty much fixed. We have this large facility, and it takes a certain amount of, you know, funding to run it every year, to, to, regardless of how much we use it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, the the more we can spread those costs among different users, the, mm -hmm. the better off we all are. So, mm -hmm. so this is really nice well, to see these. It's actually really nice to see people requesting allocations. Yeah. Well, in that spirit, I'll move for the additional water and wastewater allocation for the new restaurant at 29 North Main Street. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. And we're off to our manager's report. Yeah, I, I had mentioned a little bit under the paving thing. The, the audit is completed. Our delay was on the front end with we started the fiscal year without a finance department in terms of people as we've built that capacity up we've had uh, to work with the auditor to get this done in time we saw a draft the only remaining piece is it really is about where a debt service payment goes and the only reason that matters is that um, it'll show what that final number is as what we call unassigned fund balance so that's essentially the money above and beyond everything else um, that's been obligated or is, or is otherwise needed for something um, so it could just flip the balance a little bit in both the general fund and the highway fund. We still end up with the same sort of total dollars. You know, we spent less than we needed to um, by a substantial amount, and a lot of that's vacancy savings. So it's didn't not that it didn't come without its own cost. There was a we got a you know we've got an unassigned fund balance because we paid the pound of flesh to invest in it. Um, <laughs> It was a good news audit in a lot of ways and that I was expecting just because we had so many transitions and staffing people and we had to set certain policies aside for practical reasons um, that I thought we might have a few other things. We've got some recommendations in it, which are completely logical and the ones we'd expect. Um, you know, Make sure you hire up people in your finance department, train them up, get a finance director, do bank reconciliations in a timely manner as a result. Um, so. I think all in all, that's it's good feedback. It, it, it's what we certainly expected, and um, I think it was a good product overall. We're already starting to work on this fiscal year's audit in terms of lining stuff up so that we have that well in advance uh, of budget time. At some point, probably in July, we're looking at could be August. We'll get Bonnie Batchelder, who's the the auditor, in to walk you through that and provide you with that finalized copy and a cover memo so you can see for yourselves exactly where we. Where we ended up with all of that. Um, there was a re request from the fire district number one to be on agenda, like I mentioned in the report. We'll try to put that on for August too. I think that's what their scheduling email indicated was available. Um, and uh, but some of it is, as I mentioned it later on, in the staffing issues thing, where it's Chris and, and Dusty. Um, that's our whole water wastewater staff. That's it. And there should be four people there. Um, and we could probably use a little capacity. John and the highway crew are down three full timers, so that's almost 50% of their capacity. Harold just barely got back up to full staff, and right as he did, we lost another employee on the rec facilities end. And that's before you get into any of the other internal ones that we have going on. So we're entering another summer of staff scarcity potentially. Um, so it's. Um, 
we've tried to maintain, but at some point we're going to reach that point where we may have to retract a little bit and pull in and really prioritize and be thoughtful about how we use our people so that we don't burn out the remaining ones. And I know Scott likes doing a lot, but I don't think he also wants to drive a dump truck and, uh, and read meters, but. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> He likes being busy. I don't think he wants to be that busy, though. Um, meter, meter reading and being on patrol, it kind of sounds like the same thing. Shush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything else new. I did mention that the, it didn't come up during the bike ped stuff, but the, the line painting, we've been out trying to prioritize some of the core areas. Again, just trying to get people and tasks done. We'll go back and revisit some of the areas that we still have to do. You know, some of the more internal streets, stop bars, crosswalks, stuff like that. So. We've gotten quite a bit of it done, but we're not fully complete. And people report to us locations they'd like to see us paint, and, and we're keeping track, and we'll get there. Um, Trevor, one question about the sidewalk repairs on Main Street. There was some painting done on the sidewalk. Has that been addressed at all? Was that been that's repaired? been repaired. Actually. Well, it's been repaired, yeah. but the problem is there's paint, yep. permanent paint on the sidewalk. Yeah, I think we'll have to convene internally and figure out how exactly we want to to handle that. Um, it'll probably start with a, I will take a page out of the state's book in terms of there probably be a letter that's effectively a notice of alleged violation, which is you've, you know, you've vandalized public property. Um, and then see how we want to take it from there and see if we can get compliance sort of through regulatory means before we have to pursue any other avenue. Um, so that's, yeah, I, I have not had anyone paint on a sidewalk before, so. Not a first here in Randolph. Uh, yeah, yeah I, 17 <laughs> years before I got here, and I was like, I've seen a lot. I think I've seen it all, and right? <laughs> I give credit. I got a lot of new stuff out of these two years, so. You're welcome. Yeah. Glad <laughs> we can help broaden your acceptance. Yeah, broaden your perspective here. I appreciate it. Uh, we are doing two other sidewalk repair projects that we're looking to contract out. Um, I don't know if anybody's gone out Park Street. There's a little blue culvert that sort of was never probably installed right. It's poking its way up through that sidewalk there, creating all kinds of other issues as water pools. And so that whole section we'd like to redo. Um, and then John and his crew were thinking there's a section of Church Street where it comes down to South Pleasant that's been particularly problematic and we'd start there and then try to identify other candidates and pick away at them as we can so that's that's kind of our opener we haven't really done any sidewalk maintenance work in Randolph in quite some time at least in some sort of coordinated way so we are in earnest beginning um, that effort that was highlighted earlier but certainly the plan always helps. yeah that that sidewalk down Church Street is pretty hazardous um, I know in the past the thinking had been that at some point that whole street will need to be rebuilt and that mm -hmm. sidewalks would come along with that project, but you're thinking you can separate that out in a way that makes sense. Yeah, I think so, especially if we, I mean, it depends on to, to what extent. If we have to get into some of the subsurface stuff, we'll try to work around it, try to figure out if that's an impediment. Um, if it's you know similar to Maple Street in the, in the long term, where there's, we know there's water and sewer infrastructure, if that stuff's good, and we're talking about milling and, and paving, maybe a little reclamation, we can do that in a curb to curb model, no problem. Yeah, I was thinking more about the sidewalk, not the, the road surface, which is also in, in rather need of, of, of attention, but, um, but we, but so that would be similar. So if we were to work on the road surface there, that would be similar to, to the thinking behind Maple Street that it's going to be long enough in the future that it will make sense to take care of it now, even though we know it needs more work in the future. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those where we put in repaired sidewalk and you're talking, I mean, it depends on the quality, but if you figure even the same sort of calculus as Maple Street, where if we're getting seven to 10 years of really good useful life with some repair work, if we're doing the modest maintenance, um, if we're getting into a subsurface full money kind of project, we're at least that far out. And just even because we haven't begun the planning process for that. Right. That's all I got. All right. So we.
We do need you for executive session just to touch base on that contract piece and then to talk about the personnel piece. And I wanted to touch base on a labor relations agreement. So our contract with some union employees, just something to, to check in with you on. So I've got the three, I've put it as a two motion one, um, just to keep us safe. So this is where your first motion is that there's a finding that it's necessary and prudent. And then your second motion is to enter and provides the citations. I move that we find it's uh, necessary and, prov and prudent to move into executive session. Second. Okay. Aye. Aye. Do I do this right? Okay, consider a motion to enter executive. Wait, is that the same one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Number two. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Number two. Comes after number one. Um, consider a motion to enter executive session pursuant. You gave me the really hard one. One VSA, what's that thing mean? Statute? Yeah, yeah. 313A, 1A contracts, 1 VSA statute, 313A, 1B labor relationships agreement, and 1 VSA statute, 313A, 3 appointment evaluation of public official. Take a breath. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.